Greetings and welcome back to another discussion on my channel. Uh, many of you might know Red Pill Germany. He has his own channel. He's a physicist and he is our, uh, our resident expert on German politics because uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, I guess originally we had wanted to do this the previous month when the German election had taken place. Um, but uh, obviously I was moving and I'm actually still in the throes of dealing with that bureaucracy and it just doesn't end. And he had stuff to do, so we are uh, going to talk about that now. And uh, I think also maybe include some of the other things. I mentioned that maybe I might do a kind of video on the housing issue. I don't know if that really warrants a separate video, but we could definitely talk about the um, the housing market in Germany and how it's been affected by various things uh, due to policies and, and politics. So, uh, yes, I'm going to welcome Red Pill Germany back uh, to the discussion. Thank you for joining me. Thanks so much, Stardust. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back here again on your channel and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Yeah. So, the strange thing about the election was not that some shock, shockingly some new party won the majority. That's not what happened. Um, although, but, but, but the funny thing was, for a lot of people, particularly on the left, and I'll mention this at the beginning, that when, uh, when the election results came in, a friend of mine in the United States who is studying right now uh, early uh, modern German history, his professor, who's very uh, left-leaning, basically said I was very concerned about the results. And there was some reason that being that, surprisingly or not so surprisingly, the so-called AFD uh, got uh, six a decent amount of votes, enough to uh, show that they're sort of making progress. And this progress seems to uh, have worried a lot of people, or worries a lot of people, even though the traditional, the uh, traditional uh, powers in, uh, they're, they're, there's, they continue to exist. So maybe we can start with uh, some commentary on that. Yeah, definitely. So um, it is plain to see, I guess, that um, the AFD did not um, replace Angela Merkel's CDU. Yeah, they have a 12.7% outcome, I think, that they had. Uh, below 13, I don't know the exact number anymore, but it doesn't matter. So, um, a lot of people on my YouTube channel, for example, they commented, oh, only 12% Germany's lost, that was the last chance, Merkel got 30 plus again, how is that possible, what must happen before you guys learn? Learn something, but <laughs> to me, actually, and I always said that, um, and anything north of 10% is actually a great result for such a new party. And the point was not to kick Merkel out, because if you know anything about this uh, representative parliamentary uh, system that we have, especially a system where you don't have just two gigantic block parties, like in the US and the UK, for example, uh, but we're we're getting more towards a system like in Italy, actually, where you have a multitude of small uh, factions, uh, we used to have two big blocks that mm, in most cases had to form a coalition with one smaller member of the parliament, the one other faction, so that traditionally it used to be um, the CDU, the conservative party, the centrist conservative party that is now headed by Merkel, um, they uh, appreciated or they preferred, let's say, a coalition with the liberal party, uh, more economically liberal, smaller taxes, uh, smaller government, at least um, officially, yeah. and the social democrats, They um, since the 80s, they liked the coalition before they uh, had a coalition with the Liberal Party also, but since the 80s they preferred the Green Party. So now uh, it's not so clear anymore. So this too big and too small, so a four-party system yeah, is uh, replaced now by a multi-party system where you have from the Eastern uh, part of Germany, you still have the leftover of the SED, the Communist Unitary Party, or Unity Party, the People's Party, and now they call themselves Die Linke, so they're the Communists. Um, of course, you still have the Liberals and the Greens, but you also have the AFD now, because the CDU under Merkel um, yeah, uh, was basically transformed into a Green slash Social Democratic Party. So the AFD's um, party program. And yeah, it's a newly formed party, so a lot of people want to jump on the on the bandwagon, so to speak. A lot of 
crazy fringe elements try to find a new home in this party and to find a strong advocacy group there. And the same thing could be uh, observed actually for the Green Party in the 80s. There were strange and crazy people and they haven't denounced all of them by the way, uh, but no one holds the Green Party as a whole accountable anymore for the weird beliefs that those, um, for example, pedophile advocates had in the early 80s. Yeah? And um, now the AFD has to deal with all that stuff, but if you look at the mainstream line in the AFD, they pretty much have a program and they have ideas that the CDU had in the 80s. So they are a conservative party from a couple of decades ago. They're nothing outlandish, they're nothing crazy, they're definitely not fascists. Um, many of them lean to libertarian ideas, some of them more to traditional conservative ideas, but what they all have in common is that they want to strengthen the German economy, that they want to strengthen national identity, and um, yeah, they are opposed to um, a European Union that is more like the Soviet Union, so, um, and this was, the, the party was originally a Eurosceptic party, so they didn't like the transfer payments, um, all this um, European stability fund stuff, where we basically give a lot of money to southern European countries to stabilize them, because they cannot keep up with this low interest um, currency, that uh, the uh, low inflation currency, sorry, that the Euro is. Um, uh, yeah, this answer was maybe all over the place, but this is generally how I see the issue. So now it is all too easy, of course, for um, left-wing elements, uh, which are the mainstream now, uh, to just uh, call them Nazis, which is the go-to response when you don't have any arguments, I think. So all these people should watch less um, Indiana Jones movies and <laughs> maybe less um, yeah, tabloid press or something. Yeah, it, it's it's misrepresented a lot abroad, I think. Uh, the AFD is, is nothing that one needs to be afraid of. They are just like Helmut Kohl was. And Helmut Kohl was a respected statesman, I think. Yeah, and I think it's uh, very much indicative of the shift in our times where uh, even 20 years ago, certain political positions and uh, policies were regarded as within some sort of normal spectra, a spectrum, even within a centrist type of spectrum of, of um, left and right, but within effectively within center. Uh, now, where things have gone so far left that uh, you could, I mean, you could argue that some of the AFD stuff is, is really just right of center. It's not even far, it's not even right right in a lot of ways, I think. It has a lot to do with labeling things, because in the 80s it was always the prime directive of the conservative party that there must never be a conservative party, uh, sorry, there must never be a party politically to the right of the CDU or CSU, right? Uh, because back then, to the right of them would have meant probably extremely nationalistic, almost fascist. but. The thing is, they moved to the center and even beyond the center to the left. So now there is a party that is like the conservative party from 20 years ago, and now they say, oh, there must never be a party to our right, because that would mean fascism. But that this kind of thinking, these kind of standards, they changed the, uh, changed the goalposts, so to speak. Uh, this is thinking from 20 years ago, but we are not living 20 years ago anymore right now. So. I think they become well, a victim thing. of labels. It's interesting as well. I mean, I think this applies also the generational gap, and with that, of course, technological advancements. That the the shift in the perception of politics and society at large uh, has occurred so rapidly in recent years that it's hard to keep up. Where that, I'd say, a hundred years ago, you know, a difference of twenty years wasn't necessarily enormous. Now, everything means something completely different. That's true. Uh, we live in a, and I, th I think it's just, it's, I think it's just reflective of the culture in general. So the idea of memes that can can literally spring out of out of out of nothingness within within a within a day, and then all of a sudden a week later everyone's using using a certain meme in a certain context. And oh, when did this come out? And nobody really knows, but it's everyone's using it, something like that. 
so I think it's the same thing. Well, it's the same pattern in operation that things just shift really rapidly. And then what something means one day doesn't necessarily mean something the next day. Of course, I agree with you. I think people, you know, the kind of alarmist thinking, uh, it's, I think it's intentional. Uh, when politicians and just normal people say, oh, we're, we're really worried about the, the AFD and what could happen. and yeah, I, I think there's another thing that, that there's a kind of a history going on here. Uh, I, I think people tend to ignore history these days a lot. But the circumstance, say comparing you know, 2017 with 1920s Germany, about 100 years ago, completely different circumstances. The world has changed, Europe has changed, you could say for the worse, but whatever. Um, even if there were some drift in a direction, something like that, it would fundamentally have to be different because this isn't 1920s Germany. This isn't the, the era of 20th century fascism. And given how rapidly things travel on the internet, I mean, if somebody openly advocated for fascism, at least in the mainstream, they'd be laughed off the stage. Sure, there are some people on the internet think fascism was a great thing, whatever. But it's just, uh, it's, it's, it might just be because, yeah, the the shifting of goalposts and 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 you know the what's extreme, what was extreme back then is is not only unthinkable today, but sort of right of right of center thinking is regarded as extreme. In in this context, I was listening to a Jordan Peterson conversation with a uh, psychologist, uh, Jonathan Haidt, about, and he's liberal, who's just he created this thing called the Heterodox Academy, where you get a bunch of mostly academics from both left and right traditions, and to sort of to get together to sort of stop the madness. But I think it's just so easy just to shut down uh, people by just labeling them, as you said, you know, oh, they're Nazis or. Uh, whatever. Uh, I mean, there are people, it seems, that legit think you know, 20th century or German fascism was a great thing. In fact, you probably get, I'll probably see comments in the comment section like that occasionally. Yeah, I don't but, think they are coming from Germany most of the time, but... <laughs> well, yeah, they're not. They come from Germany, and yeah. uh, nobody... I just don't think that would ever have mainstream appeal. Not of course in not. the circumstances yeah. we live in today. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, what one has to bear in mind is that fascism is a very, very strong, very effective tool. And this is, I think, Stefan Molyneux had a conversation with some some right-wing guy or something. And um, the conversation was rational, I think, until the point that um, this right-wing person said that government is a tool. And Molyneux completely flipped out and he said, oh, you cannot compare government to a hammer because government is people. And a hammer is a hammer. Yeah, right. Um, but an organizational form yeah, or a way in which a society um, deals with politics or with policy, with their affairs, can be described as a tool. Institutions can be seen as a tool. And it depends on the environment. In war times, for example, in, in, in time of extreme danger, um, such a system has its, its measurable benefits. And that's something one needs to bear in mind. Otherwise, one, I think, um, yeah, it's dangerous to underestimate um, the potency of that system. Well, I agree with you. I think, I mean, it's, it's hard to look at 20th century fascism in, in, in general, for most people at least, with some sort of objectivity. Hmm. Um, there's a lot of obviously a lot of political pressure to to view it in a certain way, but to say outright that it it, it did nothing uh, and depends on what you define as positive or accomplished nothing. Certainly, I mean, no one would disagree that it's an incredibly powerful unifying uh, force. But it all comes at the cost of other things. And I give you another example. For example, central planning which led then to communism was a result from the, the war economy of the German Empire in the First World War. Now, in the, in the First World War, the Allies created uh, a big blockade, so we didn't get stuff through anymore. We had to recycle everything, everything from rubber to um, textiles to metal, everything was collected and evaluated according to its use for war purposes. And that was the only purpose of the economy back then. Of course, it comes at the cost of other things, but for that single purpose, surviving 
during a blockade in a war on many fronts. This system was the best and we, we, we held out for years and we invented, by the way, um, <laughs> the, um, uh, yeah, the process to make nitrogen from air instead of importing uh, salpeta, I don't know how you call that in English, but the stuff you need for gunpowder. Yeah? It came from Chile, I think, and it didn't go through the Atlantic blockade, so it, it spurred innovation and it was a system that was optimized to keeping this nation alive. But it sucks in times of peace, of course. Yeah, And what the Soviets then did is they applied a wartime economic system that was optimized for surviving a blockade. They applied that to the normal peacetime. Yeah? That, that, that is, of course, nonsense, but a very strong tool in that specific situation. Yeah, yeah. And I think, but, but there, there's, there's just too much. Well, first off, one of the reasons why I don't think that you'd get something like that now is because, uh, I mean, it, once, that's, that's why I say it's sort of ahistorical to think that at least that type of fascist regime, or, or for that matter in Italy, or really any place in Europe could uh, come back, certainly not in Germany, because how did how, how did German fascism uh, emerge and become the dominant force for a while? Well. You know, go back to World War One, the defeat, the Treaty of Versailles, the reparations, um, and uh, a depressed economy. I mean, and and, and basically a, a country that, let's face it, isn't really entirely German anymore now compared to back then when, when it was very German still. Still had a kind of a sense of German consciousness, if you want to call it that. Um, today it's not even clear... I mean, sure, if you go by sort of alt-right definitions, a German is a white guy who who's German. But in the sort of more normy thing, you know, what what the hell is a German? I you know, I, I've asked a Norwegian friend and what he considers a, a Norwegian and whatever. And so I think the circumstances that could give rise to that that type of I mean, there would be some people attached to that or, or would find that good, but by and large, I just don't think most of the population would could get behind that. Yeah, so I think it's too, too disorganized. Mm, right? So I think a lot of people would agree with the notion that illegal Im Im immigrants, especially when they commit crimes here, they must be kicked out immediately, and um, especially also other migrants or people with a migratory background who have German passports, they think like that, for example, because they came here legally. So there are many Italian Germans, there are many Polish Germans, and whatsoever, and to the alt-right or ethnic definition of German, they're not Germans, but it would be extremely hard and foolish, by the way, to kick those people out. And no more, nobody, to my knowledge, wants to kick those people out. But if you ask somebody from Serbia, if you ask someone from Croatia, from Italy, from Poland, who, who integrated very well here, they say they're voting for AFD and they want these illegals gone tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, and I think that that's the great confusion that you know, I'm still I still think it's pretty mysterious why going back two years now why this sort of and mass immigration thing was even a thing I, I mean that, that <laughs> I just find it baffling frankly I, I don't it doesn't make any sense to me well, uh, I wouldn't have done it, but <laughs> you can well, well, you can either try to explain it by Angela Merkel for once wanted to be loved by the people, <laughs> not be seen as some emotionless machine, uh, or you can say she is a um, Soviet uh, <laughs> kind of implant here who uh, was practicing for this precise moment for all her life and tries to sabotage Germany from the inside. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Other I mean, explanations exist too, but but it's what I think is is interesting about our times or the era we're living in is you can't even have a discussion like this where you say, well, look, you know, fa the fascism of that sort isn't isn't likely because of these the following factors and it's a different historical. You can't even say anything like that. No. I mean, everything is so drama drama ridden and and. Uh, Romanticize either in a super positive way and a negative. You see this on both sides. I mean, you uh, you see the people. You know, fascism, uh, worst thing ever, tends to come from the left. And you get these people who think that 
uh, fascism, particularly German fascism, was the, was the greatest thing that ever happened to to Germany. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, 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 you get these kind of these I would call them romantics, political romantics, but they they, they really pull either far left or or well, you want to call it far right. Um, and then just people who just don't want to. I think you know, you know, Germans don't really like talking about politics. You'll never really hear them talk about that in um, in a public setting. They tend to talk about their lives or whatever. We used to have something called the Stammtisch, and now there is. I remember the, learning German. Yeah, that's, there's like uh, they'd say because uh, this was years ago. Um, when I was a young man. Uh, Are you going to the Stammtisch so we could practice our German? Yeah, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. So nowadays there are Stammtische too, but it, it, it's different from what it used to be. So now if you are in some meetup group, let's say you're a hiking group and there is once a month there is the hiking Stammtisch and you talk about gear and boots and backpacks and whatnot and weather and tours. But originally the Stammtisch was a gathering where in the village The men normally, later on women too, but originally it was men, they came together, they had a closed table. Sometimes in the pub there was even like a like a little curtain or something or an, uh, a side wall that, that could be, uh, or a room separator that could be put in place so they could discuss and they discussed mostly e economics and politics. But um, since the 80s there was a cultural war against the Stammtisch uh, Everything related to Stammtisch was Nazi and right-winged and male and evil. So now nobody dares to have a Stammtisch unless it's about innocent things like what the coolest hiking gear is and what uh, tour one could do next summer in the mountains. But um, the original meaning of Stammtisch as a place where the men of the community come together and discuss stuff and form an opinion, um, yeah, that disappeared. Yeah, and something I've always found fascinating in the wake of World War II has, has been the very distinct, uh, I guess you could call it, the um, Arbeitung uh, mm. of work, working through of, of the Vergangenheitsbewältigung. 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 <laughs> even Vergangenheitsbewältigung is kind of, it's not, you don't really hear that in Austria. I was about to say that, that there's a, Austria continued to have open fascists after World War II. They didn't, it's, it's as if for them World War II barely happened. Uh, yeah, it was all the Germans, yeah. <laughs> well, well, yeah. I mean, it was obviously part, part of that is the shifting blame. Yeah. But I also think that I, I, and I, I find this fascinating because it, it seems that on a cultural level uh, in theory, both being very similar in theory, the Austrians went down a completely different route. The Austrians never, and I, I did live there years ago, um, otherwise I've visited a few times, when, and I've known a few. Uh, if you go to a place like Linz, which I think is the third biggest city in Austria, off the top of my head, I'm not sure, but you know, Linz, whatever, I don't think you're going to find these sort of rabid liberals that you might find in a place like uh, Berlin or Munich or or whatever it's it's just a different mentality and I often wondered why Austrians it's not really me saying it's right or wrong either way but why Austrians have absorbed and perceived World War II and the aftermath so differently apart from yeah shift just shifting blame and saying well it, it was all the Germans okay it was an Austrian guy whatever why So, oh, Vergangenheitsbewältigung, by the way, is this sort of literary question of you know, coming in terms of the past. I might have mentioned this a few times in the past, but anyway, why that the Vergangenheitsbewältigungsfrage became such a thing in Germany, but to my knowledge, apart from maybe some academic circles, at the at the level of the ground, you know, people, just normal people, at the level of the folk, never was an issue. I'm curious because because you you obviously are, are Bavarian in origin. So, any thoughts on because Bavaria and Austria have a lot in common in a way that uh, I don't know. Yeah, the dialect. I think. Yeah, yeah. The, the right. Bavarian dialect mm -hmm. is is also. I think yeah. all they're one dialect group. I think so. Yeah, yes, there must be a connection. Yeah, but I am from a different tribe. I'm not even a Bavarian. I'm a Frank. So, <laughs> uh, Frank, right, uh, but still, right. um, I, so I can only speculate on that. That's a very interesting question. So, first of all, I don't even, I mean, 
I can assume that it is the way you say. I don't even know if Vergangenheitsbewältigung has been much less of an issue there. I have no idea if that's true. But if it were true, uh, I could maybe imagine that they're more traditionalist. Uh, they're instead of a, a part of Vienna for example they're mostly living in rural areas and small towns just like su southern Germans also and um, even within Germany you have a, a, a west east north south gradient in when it comes to these political questions so mm, yeah maybe a more conservative um, more traditionalist mentality I, overall mm. to add to that yeah in my experience with Austrians as well that I mean, everybody hates the capital city dwellers. They call it just Die Stadt, the city, right? Yeah, Die Stadt, yeah. 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 Uh, well, that's what they say in New York State, too. We're going to the city as opposed to... You know, New York State's pretty big. It's mm -hmm. the size of Bundestag, but we're going to the city. Same disease, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, but Viennese, the Viennese in particular are really despised and loathed by everybody who... Because I, I, I when I was living in Austria, it was in Katz, which was the second biggest city... But the whole thing in the Steiermark, the Steiermark, you know, is that uh, they just fucking hate the Viennese, the Viennese <laughs> are snobs, and yeah. and yeah, I think that probably is the case because Vienna is a relatively small city, it's about a million between a million and two million people, and everyone else is, I wouldn't say rural necessarily because there's Linz and Kants, but just it's definitely a different mentality. Whereas there are ma major, large, major cities in Germany, and then. If you want to consider the the Ruhrpott is like a just one giant gigantic city, if you, in some sense, mm. it might have something to do with that. That Austria has remained kind of pseudo rural in a way. Um, also, I, I I never I think Austrians all, have always struck me as being uh, more pragmatic uh, than 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 Germans. Definitely, are, yes. Uh, in terms of the, the tradition of thought, you know. I don't think you have the nobody. So for everyone's done, you know, Deutschland land, um, that Denko and Henka, that that never <laughs> was ascribed. That never was ascribed to to Austria. I can't think of it back my literary studies was years ago. Austria is very sort of pragmatic. Um, there were some wacky theories uh, occasionally coming from certain people there, um, but for the most part, when you think of a kind of abstract intellectual tradition even in the realm of physics obviously it's much it's all north uh, of Austria Austria is sort of this strange place I don't know I wonder if that has some, something to do with it they're just sort of I hate it's going to sound horrible but sort of in some sense less intellectual in a cultural sense hard to say I wouldn't go that far because I mean Austrians are actually pretty intellectual um if you if you um, look at um, their musicians, their artists, their history, yeah. but uh, also also in the realm of science, they are actually pretty advanced. Um, I would I would say they're on par, if not even better than us Germans on average in this respect. So yeah, sure. I mean, it's oh, a awesome. it's a it's a powerful mixture, I think, of this. Um, neurotic, morbid uh, city uh, <laughs> life that you have in Vienna and then more rural areas and um, the best physicists from the US for example are from the Midwest uh, so I, I don't think coming from a rural area um, is um, a hindrance to uh, becoming very... Yeah, I wasn't uh, yeah, 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 I, I know but I think in maybe in Austria in these terms you have the best mixture you can hope for uh, so I made very good experiences um, yeah, no qua oh, yeah. no quantitative yeah. data, but this is what I think. Yeah. I, I like I like every time I've been to Austria, I've always kind of enjoyed my time there. Although it depends. Sometimes if I'm a, they don't. It depends. Sometimes they don't like Germans. Understandable. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. But, uh, mm. yeah. No, it just I just find it one of these fascinating questions. I'm sure people who are better informed historically, who have actually you know spent the time investigating this sort of. Uh, paradox, I guess, if you will, that these two countries, which both seem to participate in uh, in the events of World War II, very very different attitudes uh, in in retrospect. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, uh, 
Also, Austria is much more nationalistic. I think it, that's been the case. I also since. don't know how the occupation really looked like there. I know that they had to be neutral after World War II, and that was actually, in retrospect, the best for them. While we were really in the na in NATO, and nuclear weapons have been stationed or are still stationed in our territory, so that might also have um, taken I mean, the yeah, country Germany, down a different road. Yeah, yeah, Germany was definitely sort of pol sort of political ground zero in a way because it was divided up and if I mean effectively West Germany was a kind of territory of the United States and for the longest period of time just as um, the DDR DDR was was a, was a territory of the Soviet Union so that there had to be just I think in terms of the of the realpolitik much more political interest in those places whereas Austria was a sort of tiny place uh, I with, with with little to no Soviet influence, at least com comparatively speaking, uh, with uh, uh, but uh, it's 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 very interesting. Uh, I, I think when when you think about it, uh, how just how different uh, these places are, even though they're uh, they're both German speaking countries. Also, that an a a AFD party in Austria wouldn't uh, wouldn't cause a boo. I mean, nobody. We would really care. I mean, well, they have the FPÖ, so well, the um, FPÖ, much uh, older historic. and many, many votes. Yeah, yeah. maybe yeah. forming a coalition soon. There, yeah. the FPÖ had actually at some point in time its history. Uh, <coughs> Bless um, you, Gesundheit. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, actual fascist people who thought, not many, but they occasionally had actual. I mean, that's how different uh, Austria is in terms of. Uh, in terms of the politics, and the FPÖ, I think, is is in many ways much well, obviously, much more uh, further along the right right end spectrum. But it, then again, it's Austria, so it's it's just sort of normal. I guess so. You go to Vienna, yeah. yeah. Anyway, it's, I've, in, a bit of a, a bit of a a detour there, but I, I've always found this distinction to be very interesting. I should really go back to Austria to at least visit at some point in time. It's been years. Um, but uh, yeah, I, so. But what does it mean? Getting back to the original question, the fact that because uh, people often cite ten percent as this sort of critical mass number or percentage for anything, right? So what does it mean in your eyes or in, in your thoughts that the AfD got as far as it did this previous election? Do, do you think that? It actually is a possibility, at some point in time in the future, that uh, basically that the 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 majority parties get displaced and the the AFD takes over. Well, I think um, the coming years um, form a critical um, time. Uh, it could be a turning point from now on if they can deliver or if they will. Uh, be useless. So first of all, there is a five percent hurdle for our um, parliament. If you don't get more than five percent of the votes, you're out, yeah? and the seats are um, distributed among the other parties. So you need to have uh, more than five percent. That's important. And so I think um, they can now use the uh, parliament as a stage for actual opposition work, like they already do in the state parliaments. Um, I, I think they're doing great work there, and they're asking the right questions, and um, they have to um, yeah, put the, take the pressure to the, to the government, whatever government it will be, and uh, yeah, ask uh, uncomfortable questions, and be, um, so to speak, um, yeah, uh, uh, what's the right word here? Um, a representative of the people, uh, like what they are as members of parliament. But um, I think they have the chance now to not uh, be representing maybe large corporations or globalist ideas, but uh, really uh, represent um, the, the people, be an advocate for the people from their juris, uh, from their. Um, constituency where they have been elected, and you can see in Saxony, for example, there are you know there are two free states in Germany. They had kings back then. That is Bavaria, and that is Saxony. And uh, while they have their own constitutions, and um, in um, 
Saxony, the AfD, in many places is the largest party already. And it could become the People's Party of Eastern Germany. Yeah? But, but it all depends on what happens in the next year or in the following years. Um, if they can deliver, if they can uh, make that transition from this protest party to be taken really serious by the people and um, to not lose themselves in these battles between different factions and wings within the party but to um, stick to their program which I think is a reasonable program which which has a lot of potential for further success in the future if they just don't screw up now there are many pitfalls many people want them to fail many people will try to quote mine or to 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 um, especially in the media to to portray them in a um, yeah, in a bad way and they have to be careful as hell now they have to be really careful right now yeah yeah and I you know I actually know people in real life Germans who you know Lord bless their souls they, they just they just are left-leaning they just think it's good to take in immigrants it's good to no, oh, this is the way they think. Um, there, it's not even a question. In, in the case of the people I know, I don't even think it's a question of virtue signaling. You know, they actually think it's just a good thing. You know, it's good moral practice, whatever. I think it's a lot of so, misunderstood Christianity together with these, yeah, social democrat mainstream ideas. Uh, it's, it's a toxic uh, concoction of uh, the German mainstream, I think. Especially Christianity has been hijacked um, to a degree where I don't really recognize it anymore and uh, say as you will, Christianity is, is, is still a very strong factor, but what is sold to people as Christianity these days has nothing to do with Christianity anymore. It is just um, yeah, social democratic nonsense. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the yeah, idea that I, I it's by default Christian to just help everyone. And nowhere in the Bible can you see a phrase, just give all your money away, help everyone regardless. Huh? Um, yeah, you should give to the poor, yes, but should you uh, exchange your own population for people who can possibly feed themselves even in the future? So. I don't think this is Christianity. I don't think this is mercy or welfare in the Christian sense. That's just suicide. Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't agree with that. It's, uh, it's going to be difficult convincing people. And although, to be fair, in the conversation most recently that I had with a left-leaning friend, it was a couple of weeks ago. I mean, he admitted that things have really gone too far in a lot of ways in terms of polarizing things as absolute evil or whatever uh, so I think they're actually and this is something that uh, Jonathan Haidt mentioned in his conversation with uh, Jordan B. Peterson that there are people who are you know, liberal left who are beginning to recognize that there's a kind of separate faction of the left that's just utterly insane you know the, the kind when people say left these days, I think there is a distinction. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't want to be completely biased in my view here. There are people who are left of center who aren't complaining. They think good. X is good, and maybe someone who is right of center doesn't. But they're not completely insane about things. I'm thinking, well, for example, there's no such thing as biology or biological sex or whatever. There are people like that on the left. It's just... Uh, they might be getting shouted down by by the more extreme voices, um, but I get this feeling, and this is a prediction that he made, and, and, and I kind of agree with him that because things are, are, are coming ahead uh, and coming to a fore so quickly that maybe um, there's going to be pushback within the left against the left. I already see some of it. Uh, Left-leaning people I know or I'll see in media just thinking that this is just utterly insane uh, what's going on well and too little too late I assume so I think this is bad back paddling now because they see that their blade became blunt from overuse and I don't think that they came to see the light or something <laughs> they just see that they don't get what they want by saying the uh, buzzwords that they used to uh, um, I, I don't think that they really come to uh, terms with reality 
um, they they might make some concessions against uh, to to distance themselves from extreme SJWs here and there. But I think it's a grave mistake if uh, conservatives or right-wing people would now uh, be so happy and oh, finally some some woke and sane left people. Oh, let's let's discuss with them. Let's, well, okay, of course you can discuss with them, but I wouldn't be too friendly with them. I would I would uh, treat them with a polite uh, caution and distance, and still see them as adversaries. But uh, I don't trust them. I don't trust them one bit. Uh, it, it really depends. I mean, I guess you have to, in ter terms of the guy that Peterson was talking about, Jonathan Haim, he's, he's basically, he's, I mean, he's, a, he's an academic, but he's not, I mean, definitely, that's about a good conversation for the audience if you haven't, I'd, I'm kind of hit or miss with Jordan Peterson, but that was a good conversation. I mean, he's a guy who recognizes certain biological realities about people and actually studies the origins and roots of tribalism, and he's liberal. But, I mean, there's that type of person versus someone who's just sort of, uh, I guess, paying lip service hmm. to, uh, to, oh, well, yeah, it's really extreme. Some people are just, uh, I mean, his big concern, and I thought that was a very interesting point, and I had not actually thought about that, so that's why I learned something in the conversation, that in the United States, in the academic scene at least, uh, up until now, it had never been the case where... Uh, people, particularly from the conservative side, actually thought universities were a bad thing. <laughs> Increasingly now, there's a perception there, whether it's real or justified, I think partially justified, obviously, that university education and universities in general are a bad thing. And many of the really good universities uh, are public universities. I mean, forget the politics, but the University of California, uh, State University of New York, University of Virginia, I mean, really good institutions that are publicly funded, uh, University of Michigan. Well, what happens when the conservatives, particularly red state majorities, begin to think that uh, university just as an institution is a bad thing that produces bad ideas? Well, that's potentially very, very damaging to universities in general, specifically public universities. Yep. And so that's a, that's actually a growing concern that he mentioned. I'd never really given, I, I have to be honest, much thought to that if there's a legitimate perception, real or, or justified or otherwise, that universities are just uh, sort of the tools of Satan, um, being hyperbolic, but whatever, then, yeah, maybe. Um, maybe something could happen and you know, funding gets drastically reduced and, and what have you. So... Uh, yeah, that's why I think at least in, in academia, people who are kind of singing liberals, if you want to call them that, uh, are are waking up, if only for survival purposes, to think well, maybe, maybe everyone's taking these yep. things too far. I think they're also seeing that the impacts are getting closer. <laughs> for example, in Japan, you've seen that uh, J Japan started uh, to, or well, they stopped funding for uh, liberal arts and social mm -hmm. science uh, faculties. Um, a lot of people say, oh, this is anti-intellectual, -in but yeah, I think Japan doesn't think that uh, universities are uh, a bad institution. They just think that they need to be reformed and that uh, these uh, cancers that have been growing within our own uh, universities, they must be cut out. And this is what Japan is doing now, and this will happen here too. For example, when I hear that uh, most people, or the, the highest degree of people with a university degree uh, who voted voted for the Green Party, and then people say, aha, that means the Green Party is good, because smart people vote for them, so they have the best program. Well, uh, nowadays, many people start realizing that university degree doesn't equal university degree. And even though so they don't make the distinction in these polls. Uh, people who read that then start uh, saying, "Oh well, I can imagine what kind of graduates <laughs> vote for the Green Party, right? Sure, they have a university degree, but Aaron Clary, rightfully so, calls them worthless degrees. And uh, in the past, it might have been different, and there was value to these subjects. But nowadays, they are um, an incubation center <laughs> for little devils. I, I would go that far. Yeah, um, training." ground for a little Marxist yeah? and um, maybe these uh, sane liberals see that uh, this will not go on like this uh, and they're attacked themselves now by by the well, by, the, point, by yeah. the ghosts that they or the spirits that they called and um, they see that it becomes dangerous now so they uh, it's a it's a Hail Mary 
effort to change uh, uh, to stop this train. You know? Yeah, I think uh, actually an expat a good expression or the, sort of the, the pets eating their masters, or the pets eating. Yeah, their or the or the, the the magician's apprentice, or how is this story called? Like the Zauberlehrling or something, you know? Mm, the Geister, die ich rief. Yeah, I mean it's effectively. I mean, I don't know, you get all bitter, right? sort of the Faustian bargain, right? You, you know, you're or even playing with fire, basically that. You, you push certain ideas on people and in fact Jonathan Hyde, it was interesting, he mentioned that well into the 90s he, he had been unaware of his own liberal biases until he I think it was in, in India he spent three or four months there and research and realized certain things and came back and now he's basically apolitical I mean technically he's never voted Republican but he just, he just sees sort of conservatism and liberalism as, as spectrums of, of human psychology with relationships to each tribe. It's much more analytical than it used to be. And I think, yeah, they do eat their own. I remember, I think Sam Harris interviewed some a guy who's a, a medical doctor as well as a professor who, very liberal, and, uh, and how he was getting shouted down by his own students. And uh, it... I, I guess it's a bit of, uh, to draw the, to further push the analogy. It's imagine you know your old faithful hound dog, and all of a sudden, you know he's he's biting your leg, and <laughs> you don't even know how to react because exactly. it's just you know oh, I thought this was my dog. You know, he's not going to attack me, but so you're sort of paralyzed, and people are just terrified of uh, responding to them. Um, but and here's another interesting thesis that he offered that uh, he, well it's more than a thesis I think he did some pretty rigorous analysis so particularly in the social sciences as well as psychology where he cited some crazy you know, ratios numbers of something like in terms of liberals conservatives in the, in, at least in the United States at 14 to 1 that mm. what had happened was the people who went on to these uh, professorships they were the children of, say, the 60s and 70s, right? The, you know, the war protests and you yeah. know, love and all that, and civil rights. And the older people who retired, say, in the 90s, were more sort of, they were liberal, but to a large degree, I think it was much smaller, like 4 to 1, rather than 14 to 1. And what happened is that entire generation got itself uh, sort of nested into academia. And then all of a sudden this mass discrepancy in, in terms of political views where it's actually quite dangerous to not at the very least pay lip service to certain liberal dogma or, or left-leaning uh, doctrines um, but yeah it is I think a case of the pet eating it so, uh, sorry the, the pet eating the master or however you want to put it they, they don't even know how to deal with it and the thing that I get that, that, that I'm at a loss for because I've seen I've seen listen to some of these interviews is how some of these people think that they can still reason with these crazy, <laughs> just uh, you know, a good argument with them, and um, you put forth a good argument, and everything will be fine. But they can't. I mean, these people are just are, are lunatics. And Hyde further drew that a lot of this stuff almost has a, a, a pseudo-religious aspect to it. This idea of sort of sweeping certain types of people off a of campus is like purification almost. It it's. Uh, <laughs> It sounds crazy, but when you actually listen to how he described it, it sounds very plausible. And uh, basically, that this extreme left-wing thinking has become uh, has become a type of pseudo-religion with, with, with rituals. You know, get, you know the, you, some of these people are they go to campus, they chant things. I think it was for Charles Murray. I forgot what it, they had a rhyming chant that went on. It's not even political anymore. It's just a sort of as that's religion. Yeah, and uh, it gives them a sense of community, belonging to yeah, a group. Yeah, that's religion. Yeah, that's, also that's, does. yeah, yeah, really yeah, 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 yeah. Force of community. It's all that, definitely. So, uh, yeah, it it might be too, as you put it, uh, too little, too late. I think it might just be, uh, you know, past bedtime, and <laughs> well, they're just going to stay up now, and and and. and the adults won't be able to get them back into bed. They're just going to stay up the whole night and, and cause a lot of mischief, mischief and, and problems. Um, I, you know, I haven't been on the German university scene for a long time, but I imagine it's caught on here too. Oh yeah, especially if there is a conservative professor, for example. Uh, every now and then, you read that uh, Antifa-like groups they um, just, um, yeah, they storm into his lecture, shout him down. 
and they do that for weeks, you know, and months, and uh, at some point, even though that professor did nothing wrong, uh, and he's technically, he has tenure, but uh, the university, uh, yeah, um, gets rid of him, and um, they say then, oh, he's a hazard uh, to the uh, to the students, and, but the thing is, not he is doing the violence, not he is attacking or shouting down any, anybody, not he sabotages lectures, but those lefties, yeah, and they just don't have the, the moral strength to call the cops and carry these uh, hippies out there, yeah, or well, communists basically. Uh, so in the end, um, these bullying tactics uh, are successful in Germany. Right now, I think it's the University of Leipzig that wants to get rid of a uh, law, pro law professor, I think, yeah, because he said that he wants a uh, a Germany that stays German just as well as he wants a China or a Thailand to stay Chinese or Thai. Um, yeah, is that so far out there? Um, he's also against mass migration, obviously, and that is enough for some Antifa-like group to 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 shout him down regularly, and um, then the media interviews concerned students, of course, who 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 don't feel safe at this lecture any longer, and ah, oh, it's so wor they're so worried and they're troubled, and uh, this can't be true in Germany. We have to get rid of this man. He's evil. Uh, yeah, and then uh, this shit show will go on for a month, and then they find some little uh, thing he said in the past, or they find some legal loophole, and the guy is fired. Yeah. 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 Well, I think Peterson said in that interview as well that if that had happened to him or were to happen to him, he would just walk out and stop lecturing. I mean, or the very call, call the campus authorities or or whatever. Uh, yeah. There's. But this is old history in Germany. I mean, since the 60s, that stuff is is, is commonly happening. I mean, th this is how this outrageous liberal uh, ratio is uh, accomplished at universities. Yeah, a lot of conservative um, lecturers or professors have been uh, purged in Germany actively. And then, when the students see that, they when they want to plan their career, they will think twice, you know, before they become... Uh, professors, and it was the same with me. I mean, I could have become a professor easily, but I, I, I just didn't want to pursue a career where I would have to to really hide how I feel and how I, I, I think um, from all my colleagues. And when you're in academia, um, it is really like a club. It's like a mafia. So you and the people in your in your um, university and also all over the world in your academic discipline you see them all the time at conferences you 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 prepare conferences together you work together when you put out a paper or when you are the referee for a journal article or something you you you, you deal with the same kind of people for all your life it's like a little click and depending on the discipline you're in this click is larger or very cozy and familiar and small and you can't hide that there is no way you go drinking with these people they know your friends they know your family you, you can't hide that and i thought it would be it. yeah yeah i mean i'm i'm a very good chameleon i can do that but i don't want to so first of all i don't want to and i don't want to to you'd be forced to do that for 40 years yeah and and maybe i couldn't do i could do it for 10 but i couldn't do it for 20 maybe yeah? at, at some point something leaks and then you're screwed so i thought i have all this ability and i have a great education and, and, and yeah what do i do with that now and i thought well the industry is the place for me because at least they leave you alone there it, it all it already started there too with some um, <laughs> some yeah, political education Not campaigns, physics. yeah, yes. but but in the physics department, in the in academia, it was rampant also, and in the industry, it starts now too, but to a much lesser degree because in the industry, they're interested in the work I do and they need the stuff that I do. They they uh, are dependent on my services, so they leave me alone. Yeah, they don't try to brainwash me, but in this very um, familiar uh, a circle in academia in which you are, um, the private and the professional, it, it, it merges. And, and in that environment with this liberal bias and with the police and the courts not really enforcing the law 
any longer. I I, I, I thought it would it would have been foolish to, to pursue a career in academia. So I left. And and so all the conservative centrist people leave. Yeah? And, and, and then we're left with crazy liberals, even in physics. Yeah, yeah. Well, then there's also the problem. I've seen this in, in the public sphere in the United States. We're talking about physics. There, I don't know what it was. There was some big Titans uh, um I'm trying to think of the English term. It doesn't really occur to me at the moment. Blunder, yeah, screw up. up. Uh, Blunder, yeah, screw up. Uh, Lawrence, you know, you know Lawrence Krauss. He's sort of like a, a physicist for the public. You know, yeah, probably yeah, yeah. right. And I think Gad Sad was all of all people called him. He just said something moronic or idiotic and. A lot of these guys, uh, these science guys, we call them science guys, right? Science guys. Uh, yeah. Science guys. Yeah. <laughs> they're, 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 they're really big on virtue signals. Oh, yeah. Um, imp- well, Dawkins, I think, has been the biggest failure. This was a guy for years and years. He went on about evidence and, and how important the truth is, but allows himself to get you know held up by feminists. Uh, joined in, I, I believe, joined in the condemnation of uh, of, of Watson when he was uh, stripped of his uh, mm, Nobel yeah. Prize yeah. And, and all the stuff. Uh, and I mean, clearly, for example, Dawkins, an evolutionary biologist. Did he join always, Atheism Plus? <laughs> uh, I don't know. He didn't. I yeah. think that was a bit too <laughs> The much feminist much. version of atheism. He wants to maintain his reputation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is the thing. Is They're tortured it? creatures. I pity them. Yeah. Well, the thing is, I, what, I, what, I, what really creates a, sen- a, a kind of resentiment in me with regards to Dawkins is he used to cite these great stories of, of, of scientific minds conceding their mistakes and errors after uh, somebody revises their theory, mm, oh, I've yeah. been wrong these 30 years, thank you for correct. And here's a guy who's just going along with the program so he can maintain his reputation until he dies. And then, well, he can't fuck up anymore after that. But uh, huge, huge failure. Because an evolutionary biologist who doesn't, uh, I don't know, it, who said all, all things should be studied every and then he just uh, he just goes along with the liberal program. I mean, I'm pretty sure he's left leaning, but he never struck me as a kind of dogmatic left leaning guy uh, up until recently. And and even then, I just think he's just afraid of condemnation. Uh, Dawkins has been as, of all the science guys, public figures, the most disappointing public figure of anybody. Yeah, because he knows certain things, obviously. And uh, he does, and then there are the rest of them, you know, Krauss uh, and and some others. He sort of, uh, I guess, advocates to the, the public. They're just doing a huge disservice uh, to everybody, going along with uh, the, the the dogma of our time. And yeah, what and that, as you pointed out, what, what's left? Just a bunch of, of fucking loonies. I mean, maybe some people that can teach you about quantum theory and then they'll lecture you about how, I don't know, how Trump is uh, Satan incarnate at the same time. Precisely. Uh, yeah, and um, I, what really annoys me also about science discourse in general is that science is like the the argument that beats everything. Aha, a scientist said X, Y. But argument pe- from authority. Yeah, yeah, people think that scientists are these saints and stuff, but from f- 20 to 15 years working in science and technology, I I have to say, I, I trust them less and less. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I mean, I was in there. I, I saw what's going on, all the fraud that they commit and all the all the pressure also that they're um, exposed to. Yeah, they, they need to get funding. They... They worry about their reputation so much because these people, they're, they have really big egos. I mean, you, you can become a small, mediocre researcher maybe without an ego, but if you want to be a top professor, you, you don't do that for the money probably. Yeah? You do that because you have this big ego. You want to be uh, liked by people. You want to be appreciated. You want to be the smartest guy in the room and you want everyone to agree with you and then say how brilliant you are. And, and, and that would all go away once they say the wrong thing. And um, yeah, in many cases it's a cult that they create around their persona and their, their, their ego is dependent on that and not only the ego, as I said, it's money, it's state funding, it's government funding. I mean, here, here in Germany, most of the money for these professors comes directly from the state or the federal government or from some organizations that are basically 
belonging to the German state and um, they can't say anything out of line they, they just can't I agree with you from an outside perspective of a non-scientist it does seem pretty corrupt I continue to cite the story of my father as this Hungarian friend who about I think it was a decade ago now was actively uh, trying to get a professorship. He ended up giving up and well, moving back to Hungary, also for personal reasons. But in any event, he had some somewhat controversial theory in the field of geophysics, and some people actually accepted it and thought it was good. But man, it was just fought against so hard. Uh, even if I don't, even if it had been true, uh, you know, because I think just big egos were involved, and so. I think ego's always been involved in, in science. Uh, we look at the battles between Leibniz and, and Newton for mm-hmm. example, in their day. That's not really anything new, um, but the the public funding, the uh, the fact that the public is, is very uh, much involved in the project can affect things. And, yeah, I... I yeah, science is a human beings, but I also think there's a natural tendency because science is such a powerful tool. There's someone as a scientist. There's this natural, there's a, almost a kind of assumption that you can ascribe to that person a greater sense of authority and even a greater capacity to think, covering other subjects. So, so someone might be uh, an amazing geophysicist and then you ask him about you know what he thinks what he thinks about certain economic policy when he knows nothing about it mm. and he might give an yeah. opinion yeah einstein for example theory. was very aware of that i mean he he said because einstein commented on social questions also and he said he knows that this is not his area of expertise but he is also a citizen, not only a physicist, so he will not shut up about that, knowing very well that he is not an economist or something, right? So he was at least aware that when he comments on other issues, he, he doesn't have the same authority as when it comes to relativity or quantum phys- physics. Huh? And um, also, very interesting, I think, many people these days, they just go opinion shopping. Huh? So there are, for example, physicists who are pro-nuclear power and there are physicists who are against nuclear power. So what does the media do? They only cite people who are against nuclear power and who grew up uh, with uh, in a leftist community somewhere in Western Germany yeah, during the 70s. Um, of course they have a bias against that that doesn't mean that physics tells us nuclear power is bad and um, in the in terms of climate physics for example or climate science or studies or whatever it's not and um, they did that even in an institutionalized form they uninvited people from conferences that were about this topic who had a different opinion and then Afterwards, they said, aha, 97% of scientists agree. Yeah? It's ridiculous, of course. Yeah? They excluded the other ones or bullied them out of their clique to begin with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, I gotta say, of all the things, that probably is the thing that makes me the most uh, depressed about the whole issue, uh, both these many issues, particularly science, that even in the natural sciences, and I'm not even talking about biology or things related to <laughs> things that, well, obviously everything has to do with physics and, and, um, and chemistry and biology, but things that doesn't that don't have anything to do with human beings explicitly. That there's a yeah, increasingly a political angle uh, to everything. It makes me very uh, skeptical that we're we're going to make any real progress. Um, well, I, I guess it was inevitable. I don't want to talk too much about it because I find it pretty bland and boring, but. Um, that recent video by uh, Urban T. Yeah, this is why you said skeptical. That was the right keyword here. Yeah, well, I've had, you know, I leave comments sometimes on these skeptic videos and I say, <laughs> well, look, I don't think the skeptics are skeptical of anything. <laughs> they sort of get the fuck out or whatever. But They're, they're really cute, just, I it was, think. Yeah. It was just, um, you know, I, here, and here's the thing. I used to talk to Kraut and T because I used to think he was an alright guy. Um, but he, he's got a huge ego and one that is... Uh, well, it'd be, it'd be like me making this huge video about quantum mechanics when I know almost nothing about no, it. No, you know what so, you could do? You could you could uh, invite me and say, oh, the physicist said actually. Yeah, and, and 
you could but borrow I mean, knowledge here, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. But I, why? Was, was why do that to begin Anyone with? Anyone who has any any basic knowledge of genetics, I have some decent knowledge in it. But even just the way he was going about it, and and, and just also just bad reasoning. Uh, for example, it's completely ridiculous. Um, this video, the the, the inferential. Uh, for example, what, towards the end where he just repeats, "Don't need to know the gene," and I'm just thinking, well, do you know what inductive reasoning is? But anyway, we don't know the really precise bad. genes about many other things where no one has any doubts well, that there is a strong genetic, genetic component. component. Yeah, it's, yeah. I mean, and it's, so. There are at least 20 levels on which I could attack this video. It's wrong on not only one level, it's it's wrong but on really so many levels, already. but... Uh, alternative hypothesis. Yeah, alternative hypothesis. we don't have to do that here. Really, yeah. um, but I guess what I was... You know, I was, I was citing that as an example. Yeah, of just yeah. Extreme bias. Yeah, um, it's ridiculous. In, uh, so one thing, and I've actually been considering getting Ryan Falk on for a discussion about this, that I find is an interesting question, uh, is sort of cold winter's hypothesis, which I actually don't believe in increasingly, not because I think it's in, implausible, because the time span is too great. I've looked at more recent research um, that suggests that you know there can actually be fairly uh, great leaps in cognitive ability spanning in only a few hundred years, given sufficient eugenic um, breeding patterns. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, there's a, there's there's a there was an article, part of a book called "The Ten Thousand Year Experiment" by Guy Cochran, who's an anthropologist, physicist. Uh, a, a natural history of Ashkenazi intelligence, was, which explains in detail how, in approximately 800 years, you can go from an average intelligence to just by fractions over generations. Um, and then there was the ex mass execution of criminals in, in England. And so, and there, I think there's just more. I, I find the Winters, Cold Winters theory interesting, but there, but I guess these are good examples of questions that are are not. You can't even ask these questions. Yeah. Yeah. Because they're not. They close uh, their eyes and say, "La la la, I don't see anything." Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> For example, I, I, one of the reasons, I mean, you don't see any high civilization in Northern Europe until much, much later, uh, after the Romans and, and Greeks. So it's just. So I think that's actually an implausible theory. Not because I think it's crazy. It's just it could work, be true, but I just think it probably happened later. But it it could it definitely makes sense in the sense that you know planning for four months at a time. Uh, to survive when you don't have uh, when you can't plant crops effectively uh, makes sense um, and also th the other thing that I thought is as someone who has a, a personal interest and, and, and some knowledge about selection pressures uh, and environment you can assume that uh, different differentiated environments are going to pr pr produce identical outcomes um, that you're going to get even in similar environments uh, you, you're going to across different parts of the world. You're going to get different uh, uh, outcomes. So it was it was a terrible video, but obviously the guy was really biased, and obviously Kraut Kraut kind of embodies the this the the yeah this I, he's not making videos because he's interested in the science. Sorry, phone went off. Um, in the science. Or, or really, even in the not. I mean, just, the title of the video, yeah, Group X is too dumb for Y. Yeah, he always, these skeptics always make these videos. Who doesn't get this, and who has the wrong ideas about that? It, this is right. not that they're interested in the questions. Come on, that's ridiculous. Yeah, but that's why, if you back when his original video about the whole R and K, I made an R K video too. It was completely different format. Obviously, I was really just trying to. Basically, describe the science and how it's progressed with life history theory, etc., and how it's that that generally is a better model for describing um, things. But it didn't really; I wasn't attacking anyone uh, specifically, at least. And I, I, yeah, that's what I don't. He's part of this sort of, at least on the internet, the sort of pwnage culture. Yep. Of, you know, I'm going to go pwn this person, and if I pwn him, it's going to look really good. And but These I, people annoy me without end, especially when they use science as some kind of pornographic element in their whole argument. I mean, just the, the pace at which he changed these background images of scientific diagrams and drawings and tables. It, it, it's just, oh, look, look, I looked at complicated stuff. Yeah, It's, it's ridiculous. The strange thing, too, is based on some earlier conversations I've had with him, I think his parents are geneticists, actually. Um, I, 
I, maybe I might be completely wrong. I seem to have that in recollection. He could just ask his parents about this stuff. So is it a freak accident of mutation, or is was there p paternity fraud? Maybe I, <laughs> uh, occurred. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> he just, but he's an example of a guy who's just willing to uh, look. I don't, I don't think uh, everyone is free from this. I think alternative hypothesis and occasionally mistakes as well. Um, and I also think that he's ideologically driven, if I'm perfectly honest, although I, I think he tries to stick with the data much more. So, but Crowd is just this representative of the guy, the sort of liberal guy who just will use science as he pose a bludgeon or a hammer to... Uh, it, it was pretty awful. But there are, a lot of, there are a lot of people like that also in the public sphere. Scientists this, scientists that. Um, as long as the science kind of, well, sort of can sort of make sense. And one thing that I think Ryan Fogg, the alternate hypothesis, pointed out, which I thought was a pretty valid point, is this this shift that, because the guy misre at least misrepresented uh, quantitative genetics. And whereas molecular genetics is a much earlier stage, I mean, we're, it's just not as, as developed as, as quantitative genetics, to use this as a kind of science of the gaps which I think will be filled up increasingly as time goes by. And my concern, obviously, is uh, we need people to be able to do good science free, relatively free from ideological constraints. I think as, as more and more um, scientific information regarding genetics progresses, uh, there's going to be, well increasing con the conflict and there won't be enough sort of science of the gaps to explain things at some point in time people will shockingly have to accept that you know people are different from each other and it's not the end of the world right? <laughs> it's not as if they didn't notice that the guy the one guy who was you know 190 centimeters and the other guy who was 171 you know people weren't different but hey that's that might be news for them. <laughs> yeah, this is a point I really want to uh, also stress here. Um, if you give me the opportunity, sure. um, I mean, as much as I think that uh, these differences are real, like between the sexes, between different population groups, it is not the the, the most defining or most most uh, important thing in life. I mean. Um, there is a cult about intelligence, for example. It, it, it's really IQ is 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 hyped up to be this 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 all important quantity. Yeah, uh, yeah, it is important. I'm not I'm not saying it's not important, but um, it is it is not helpful or it's not productive. It's not healthy, I guess, to to look at populations or look at society or people and groups only in terms of these factors and that these differences. The the thing that makes me so sad is that um, when when people don't allow discourse and, and arguments over these very real uh, um, differences anymore, they almost give out the appearance and they do that for moral reasons. They almost make it look like it would be the end of the world if we were different and, 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 and that if we actually found out that Europeans have higher IQs than uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africans, of course we need to put them in camps. What do you think? It's ridiculous. Uh, yes, we are different, oh, yeah. but that does not mean that uh, we should in any shape or form commit atrocities or something. Nobody said that. Yeah? Okay, some people said that, but I'm also against those people. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the thing is, I work in a factory, for example. I work with very low IQ people. And we use them productively. And they are good people. They're good members of society. Yes, they will never be able to understand quantum physics or even biology. But they are good people. They have lower IQs. And it's fine. Yeah? The same with women. They don't get certain things. They will never take responsibility, maybe. But this is nature. Yeah? We have to deal with that. That doesn't mean that we put them in camps. Okay? So what makes me so sad is that the left almost acts as, as if the existence of these differences would mean that we have to put them in camps. There are these differences, yeah. but we can live with them. It's okay. Well, the thing, the thing is actually is that nothing changes once you, ignore, once you openly ignore. I mean, for example, what if, the, what if I think the reality would acknowledge that there's something, uh, obviously there are, other, there are a few other issues, there are cultural issues, there are 
issues of geography, but but let's just say on average, uh, sub-Saharan Africans uh, aren't as smart as your average European or Northeast Asian or whatever. Well, what's going to happen? Well, well, nothing, because it's going to be the same thing that's been the case for, for decades. It, we're not, by acknowledging that, nobody... It's, it's not, not like they perform or, better or because we think they have the same IQs. Yeah, exactly. That that's never been the case. You know, Ugh. thinking that everybody is the same has never uh, has never been effective in making them the same, or at least allowing them to approximate the same performance uh, ability. But I, I just don't. I guess I don't really see the the big deal. Now there could be, I think, theoretical consequences in increasing the automated society. Uh, actually, I'm going to be making a video about this soon. Um, sort of cognitive elite, something that Charles Murray talk, talks about. But it's still not the end of the world. I mean, the, and at some point, I mean, you got to acknowledge these things, right? I mean, it. When are you? When are you? When the amount of ev evidence? I mean, it's going to reach the stage, particularly in the the biosciences, particularly in genetics, but in biosciences in general, where people are just they're, 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 as you put it, sort of living two lives. They, in the, in the public, they'll say things that are completely wrong, and then they go to the lab to do actual work, and and it's like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde almost. They're doing the real work in the lab, and they go out in the public, and they just lie their, their, their teeth off, their face off. And I just don't understand why we can't get to that stage where we just say, oh, people are different. Because we all know that people are different because we grew up with people that were different from us, that were taller or more beautiful or smarter or dumber. Or some people had red hair and other people had black hair. And most people have brown eyes. Some people have light eyes. It's, it, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah, well, some so, some went to school uh, performing really well with little effort, and some people, despite very hard work, uh, couldn't get high marks. Uh, we also yeah. know that from school. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a biological it's reality. People, people are different. So acknowledging at the population, but that's okay to say individually. But at the population level, um, I mean, there are people. Uh, there are people. Will say, I think Ryan Falk will be one of them. You have these population level differences, hence we need a white ethno state. I actually don't agree with that, but um, but hey, but some people will think that. But I think most people would would just say, yeah, you know, okay, that's the way it's always been. So you know, you could. I, I do think though that we need to be as a society increasingly aware of of IQ differences because there will be um, this automation coming and and other things, but. Uh, also question whether or not uh, I mean Jordan Peterson's talked about that you know, people in a certain spectrum of IQ or intelligence, whatever simply can't do anything I think he mm. told the story about how some guy wasn't even I guess bright enough to distinguish the lettering on envelopes that was in French or English mm. and he didn't know any French so pretty obvious what, you know, that sort of thing and um, yeah, so I think there might be some discussions people could have, uh, but yeah, wow, people are people are different. Uh, I guess the real question will be always the question of of what people do with that. And the question for decades is, you no, know, we do, we can do this, we can do welfare programs, but I don't think it's been very effective. Um, that's why I think that there could be actual consequences if people publicly acknowledge things. Hmm. Um, but then again, even with with uh, even with real evidence that I don't think I said this a million times, but nobody thinks the welfare state is an effective tool in I don't know encouraging the family unit. It's a very effective to, uh, tool to make the problems worse. I think right, <laughs> to, right, to, right, it's but, a dysgenics but, but, mechanism. But, yeah. but the, the but the yeah. system and the program that's been in place now for decades is so entrenched and so yeah. heavy. That it doesn't matter. You could, you could. I mean, I'm just making this up, but you could, you know, produce mathematical proofs that it didn't work, and supported by the greatest mathematicians alive, and then they would say, oh, "It doesn't matter." Is it? You know, this is how we just do it. Uh, it's basically the German, uh, the man macht das halt so. Yeah. Right? And yeah. Then, so we're used to it. Yeah. But I think uh, when more and more people come into Europe 
and they don't contribute and from living side by side with them we get even the non-scientifically trained people become more aware of the apparent uh, differences between population groups when it comes to certain averages and I think the the um, Ah, the tolerance for this gigantic welfare state that um, benefits these newly arrived people uh, to such a large degree uh, will diminish I think so people will just not be well they will not be okay with doing that anymore and the political pressure will rise um, so I see turbulent times ahead and of course I'm not the first to say that I don't say that the first time either but it's fairly obvious that um, things will change yeah well it's certainly possible I remember reading that report uh, well no, hearing about that report from some Dutch guy who was returning from I believe it was uh, Czechs, uh, the Czech Republic in any event coming back to some major station, a uh, train station in, Amsterdam, in, in the Netherlands and mm. it's wondering if it, you know, it was unrecognizable. Where are the Maybe. Dutch people? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's the same. You know, my, fr my friend, my friend that was helping me move, the liberal guy, he was joking. He said, well, you know, if you, he was joking, but also, you know, if you move to Hungary, they'll, you know, there won't <laughs> <laughs> said something like the fact that there won't be any uh, yeah. foreigners anymore, or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. yeah. As a, I mean, that isn't a, a, an appeal per se to me. I mean, yeah. although I, Germany is kind of this, uh, I, well, whatever, Germany is kind of gone. But <laughs> I think, I, think hey. well, I, I do think I, I, I don't increasingly because mostly because of personal stress here, but. I just don't really enjoy living in Germany anymore, but I, I do think it's transformed a great deal. I mean, we were talking before about how difficult it was to find housing. I live in a, in a major city, and no doubt that the immigration policies in Germany has had have these have had an effect on that. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I think if if I ever if I did consider living in Germany at some point, maybe I'd go to someplace like Mecklenburg. Because yeah. Like, nope. yeah, you can you can you can live on a farm in Brandenburg, maybe. Yeah. So, well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. So what I could say about that is um, there is upward pressure on the on the um, housing market. So, for example, um, in former decades, um, the state was doing a lot of social housing projects for not homeless people or welfare recipients, but just for people who had a lower income, and then they would qualify for uh, renting an apartment there. Yeah, that was fine. The government made sure that uh, even people with lower incomes, it wasn't the nicest area, of course, but uh, they had an okay apartment. And this doesn't happen anymore. All that space is now confiscated. All this uh, is used to house even more immigrants and their families and um, the people who can just so afford it you know maybe they maybe they spent 30% of their disposable income for these apartments before now they have to spend 60% of their disposable income for uh, their rent yeah? and the people who would be in those apartments before now uh, they have they are one tier above in income they have to also spend more of their disposable income and so everybody pays more for rent or for housing in the end and uh, because there is this large group of the bottom of society who was brought in who doesn't pay anything and who is in all these uh, in these apartments now and uh, this is creates an upward pressure through the entire um, yeah level structure of, of, of class and of uh, apartments and uh, house on the housing market and this is what we see and the other effect is that a lot of young people I mean the breeding grounds of the Germans are of course the suburban areas and the small towns and the villages in more rural areas uh, but these young people then they want to get the flashy jobs in the city of course they also uh, influenced by media programs maybe like sex in the city or something or any kind of soap opera that plays in a hip uh, town like Cologne or Düsseldorf uh, they want to go to these places so and they're young students they can't afford shit and but they want to live in in the center of a very rich city <laughs> how does that work yeah and then they not even that I mean I remember when I was still looking uh, this was the sub 
practically the suburbs of, of, the, of the city I live in. And um, I arrive there and sort of a queue to, to, to view the place. And then there are 20 other people, including a daughter and her father. And they drove a, driven, driven all the way from way out there. And it was reasonably expensive. And there, all these people interested just in living there. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Their parents pay for it then. That's what the outcome is normally. Well, yes. Or they, so or they heckle that. and petition the government to, to give them well, not, free not just that. It's just housing. That there was a kind of, what I thought was really weird about the whole process was that, you know, I'm, I'm self-employed. Uh, that just didn't seem like a good thing to almost anyone. Yeah, well. The only way I actually, it was a complete kind of fluke almost that I got the place, which isn't that great that I'm living in now. Is because my French is reasonably fluent. Because when I showed up here, where I'm living now, to the viewing, uh, the guys he was just like French in every way. I saw his name and the way his. I'd, so I just usually, if I speak a language, I'll just try to speak to the uh, people. Although I recently been trying to get that Quebecois guy uh, on, and he got insulted. I was trying to speak French. I don't know why, but anyway. Uh, and so I spoke for I've, the entire relationship of getting the current apartment was conducted in French and. I think that's why he basically put in the good word me with the landlady because there were other candidates but none of them spoke so it's it wasn't because of my job or it was just because oh I happen to speak French that's great so you know like oh this guy's cool he speaks French so <laughs> there's nothing to do with you know I'm good for the money or I, I had a, a letter of recommendation from my former landlord for six years I never missed it it was no he speaks French he's cool I mean th lots of things in life are like that but it I, I just, it's it just the, the process was just so bizarre. Um, and really, it wasn't, it didn't used to be that way. I remember it wasn't always like that in, in Germany, but it, it just seems a lot more uh, difficult, which is why I'm kind of happy I, I found a place at all. Um, because I, I thought I was that close, I was that close to giving up and saying, you know what, I'm just going to move back to the States for a while, try to figure something out. <laughs> Although I couldn't afford to live there, but still, I, I'd figure something out. Uh, yeah, it's, it, I, I think it, it's going to get worse and worse, too. Yeah, I think uh, landlords uh, become more and more uh, wary, or uh, they try to be very careful who to rent out the apartment to. And in times like these, when you're, when you're not a German, when you don't have a steady job at a large corporation, or you work for the government, or you're yeah, ordinarily employed, uh, uh, standard employment yeah. uh, people are kind of suspicious I have to say uh, and in, in some it, it varies with town and state of course um, but in many places I can't even blame them for that uh, too many bad apples well, I'm not, but I'm not but 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 it sucks of course it sucks yeah and but, but I'll, yeah. I'll give you an example of thing I, when I was looking that they would you know, I'd, I'd show up to basically a hole in the wall. It would be renovated because it was convenient. <laughs> oh, yeah. And yeah. I don't have special needs, really. I basically yeah. just need a room where I can kind yeah. of crash and then just do my work on the computer or whatever. I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take it. And, and the play, they were actually asking for uh, something like 60% less than my current rent at the time. And then they still, but somebody, they chose some student over me or I don't know. It, it was just very strange. I, I totally understand the um, I guess the reluctance and the caution yeah. of, of certain people these days. Um, in fact, that's what my landlady told me when I met her. She said, "Well, you know, you'd be shocked because I, I thought, well, you know, look at my track record. I'm good. I'm good. You know, reliable." Um, but but yeah, she said, "Well, you know, you have no idea the experiences I've had." And so mm -hmm. okay, mm -hmm. fair enough. Um, so yeah, I know I, I understand that, but. I think if the immigration crisis hadn't happened, uh, my my efforts. Well, actually, you know, put it this way: if the immigration hadn't the crisis hadn't happened, if immigration as a rule had just been for years now decreased, I think my my time to find a place would have been a lot easier. Definitely, uh, well, I would yeah, say so. Cheaper too. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's definitely that's been a that's definitely a struggle, and then. And we were talking privately about this. I, I, I don't know if German bureaucracy is worse than other bureaucracies, um, but in my experience it is, uh, just going through different things. Um, but yeah, I, I guess it's different depending on where you live and the state you live in and, and all the other things. Um, but one thing I'm sure of is that all this mass immigration 
I have not received any personal benefit from it uh, at all. Uh, so, in fact, it's made certain aspects of my life that I'm looking for a new place more difficult. Well, they didn't have people like us in mind as beneficiaries when they when they put in place these policies. Uh, yeah. We are not meant to benefit from that. So <laughs> I'm trying to figure out who who is meant to benefit. <laughs> That's the thing. Yeah, people who own houses, for example. People who, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, in the immobilien mafia, the um, I guess real estate agents, they they just, I mean, they must love it. It's just a seller's market. Yeah, they, they, can, they can have so much choice. They can do whatever they want. And when uh, they when when they uh, put migrants in there, the government pays them, and the government always pays. You know, <laughs> and yeah. they pay a lot. They, some people get rich with that, you know, just taking an old farm and renovating a little bit and then putting migrants in there. They become millionaires, yeah. So, and um, also, uh, it, yeah, it's also the Caritas. Do you know the Caritas or the no, Dia, no. Dia, Diakonie? I mean, Caritas has, I think, about one million employees in Germany and they just oh. ran out of people to care for. Just for the audience, maybe Caritas is a Catholic uh, um, welfare organization basically so they are partly church but they also get a lot of government money and they, they have stuff like kindergartens uh, houses for the elderly they have hospitals and they care for people and uh, they just ran out for people to care for because Germany normally doesn't produce so many welfare cases but they want to grow they want to expand you know they, they, they need to grow their business uh, so they thought oh we get we get people who can take care of themselves, people who will forever uh, be dependent on the state and on welfare. Ooh, you know, that's that that sounds like a lucrative deal for us. So of course they're for that. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of an unintentional conspiracy of, of joint interest. Yeah, yeah. To uh, <clears throat> maintain the status quo, and that's always the case. They maintain their power and their jobs are secure for yeah, the future. That's I say this about the American drug war all the time that you know nobody nobody thinks it's actually effective. They have not thought that for decades, but maybe the odd person. But you know there are hundreds of thousands of employees working for the U.S. government involved in dealing with and confiscating and fighting the quote unquote drug war. So you know, we'll just keep that going. It, yeah. Uh, I, what can you do about that? Um, I guess the final question I'd ask is, uh, you know, is, is it too late for Germany? Oh, oh God. Uh, what can I say? I mean, depends on what you mean with Germany, really. I mean, sure, we will survive somehow uh, in some weird pocket of the globe. Um, but for the current state, uh, the Federal Republic of Germany, uh, I... I think it will not be able to survive in its current form at least um, and um, maybe there will be a balkanization maybe there will be another 30 years war or something like that civil war possibly um, there are there are definitely um, um, areas here uh, territories where um, other factions but the local inhabitants would have no chance if uh, no foreign power intervenes, so just from what we have in Germany here, uh, there is no hope for for them. In other areas, there is hope uh, uh, for them, and um, yeah. But I I would say we they are located in the city cent centers largely, and that could turn out to be a huge disadvantage for them when it comes to war. But maybe if we don't even have to go that far. Yeah, I think uh, once our um, economy just has a little bit of a hiccup, for example, we're very strong on the internal combustion engine and the automotive industry, not only making cars, but also the entire industry the down the supply chain that, that deals with uh, providing the machines and the parts for making ca cars. Uh, if 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 that would uh, decrease, I'm not 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 even crash, but just stagnate or decrease, um, that could be a big problem. I mean, taxes are exploding in Germany at the moment. Since the cr crash, 2007-2008, uh, it was one one boom year after the other, uh, and, and and there have never been as many taxes 
collected in Germany as, my as right now. Costs go up every year. Oh, 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 yeah, of course. Because instead that our government would, would balance the budget or pay back some debt, what they do is they just leverage it even more and they, they make more new debt and they find new little projects where, can, where, where they can spend the money. Yeah, They want to give money to Africa. They want to bring Africa here. <laughs> it's just if you give them more money, they spend 10 times the amount. Yeah? So when the high taxes means that we are uh, getting deeper into that hole. So actually yeah. lower tax revenue would actually be good. But now we have accumulated so many welfare cases and so much entitlement here already that it will not go peacefully, I think, at this moment, yeah, if, if, if the tax stream uh, will get thinner. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to be making a video about this. I'm skeptical of a kind of mass or even small level armed conflict theory that I hear often from different circles. Well, I'll probably go about in the video, but certainly in my view, Germany is not... Maybe it never was, but certainly was, Germany's not what it, it used to be. Yeah, this I, well, the the land, Denker uh, and Henker. Well, maybe if it had Dich ever. Dichter und Denker. Yeah, exactly. Um, but Denker and Henker well, is not a bad always, thing, so I take it. Or there was another one, um, uh, Dichter und Richter. That was yeah, that's one. also good. I like both. We should have yeah, Henker and Richter. That would be great, huh? <laughs> Then it arrives. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I, Germany is just not. It just seems to just be less and less of the good things that I could used to be able to appreciate Germany. I just feel really. It's up. It's kind of shock, shock. I feel very foreign in in Germany in, in a strange way. Yeah. Not just that I'm a foreigner in Germany. I've always been that, but. Almost like I'm the wrong type of foreigner. My my certainly my experience looking for a place gave me that sense. I think if I my name were Mohammed or Ahmed, it might have gone might have gone uh, better. In fact, um, but there, yeah, I, I just I feel increasingly completely out of place uh, in Germany. When when I used to sort of feel, well, I'm not German, but I can appreciate X Y Z. Now I just feel like. I just don't really want to be. I know I'm just complaining. I'm working on getting out. So people say, well, let's <laughs> leave. I, it's not that simple. No, but, I understand yeah. it perfectly. I mean, um, I feel like a foreigner in Germany many times. Always have, I think. But um, sometimes I experience these nice little gestures or moments that make me feel at home. Um, in a pub, like when a stranger just starts talking to, to me and we, we, we talk about recent events and uh, say goodbye politely or uh, when for example I uh, yeah, have re personal relationships with the people in my small town where, where I live these are little moments where I really feel at home but I know that this is just this special pocket of Germany or this special area maybe where you have that still it's a more rural area uh, but maybe I'm I mean I'm also emotionally invested in my country of course I, I love my culture I love my country and uh, of course I don't wanna I don't wanna uh, admit maybe that it's, uh, it, it, it's it's not gonna last but yeah sometimes it's nice to just daydream going. and think oh how nice is this here this little old the bakery cities don't Remember, rem resemble any yeah I'm not a big uh, fan of German cities uh, yeah well you're right they're not German yeah. maybe they have never been but nah, <laughs> it's possible they've never been German yeah. uh, I've lived in German cities and in German towns I've lived in both I lived in uh, actually Swabian and Bavarian towns that were quite nice Excellent. <laughs> um, yeah I've lived in Eastern Germany I've lived in Western Germany I've lived kind of almost all over Germany, um, and yeah, the cities are definitely, well, especially these days, just not, well, not very German, other than maybe some people speak German, but apart some, from that, yeah. <laughs> some, some people, well, it's not uncommon, I see, <clears throat> especially recently, I had to drag my ass to the insurance office to take care of pointless bureaucracy that they created for me, that, you know, the they'll have these, I don't know if they're mic, I don't know what they are, but these people uh, who bring interpreters with them, and, you know, that's how they basically get by for stuff like that. Paid and for by you is truly. 
No, 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 no. Family members and stuff. Ah, okay, okay. So it's not state issued uh, interpreters because they get that. Uh, Okay. Oh, they do. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. They get. It's it's usually family members who. Oh, in that case, it's great if they can do that. Yeah. Well, it is, I guess, but I I don't know. It's. I, I think in general, Europe, Western Europe is is effectively gone in any sense, of traditional sense of what it was, uh, and I think it will increasingly uh, decrease. Increasingly decrease. That doesn't make sense. sense but here's to get, I guess, get worse because all the all the things that led to uh, the current destabilized state of affairs are still in place. They're they're getting worse. No, I mean some people talk about opposing it, but let, let's be real. A lot of the stuff that we see that, that worries about this out loud is just sort of internet noise, right? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it's not. It's on the ground. There are no policies for that, and nobody talks about these things. So, yeah, what can you do? A little bit, uh, a little spe- sign of hope that I see is that the young generation, even though they don't speak out about that because they're just too young, but they seem like they become um, more and more conservative uh, overall. And it's not so. It's not about these big political questions. It's seemingly, seemingly, um, yeah, uh, innocent little questions like. Uh, they don't eat at McDonald's so much anymore. They eat bratwurst again. It, it, it's it's unimportant stuff, you might think, but they they get a feeling, and maybe they don't understand it in, intellectually, but they are more drawn to German things now. That's what I see here, at least. Uh, and maybe in a big city it might be different, but here I can see because they see that stuff in the news also, and they like it here. Uh, where Germany is still quote unquote okay, and uh, they identify more and more with German culture and the German nation. So uh, it seems like things are drifting apart, and in some areas, the young people become actually more identitarian, more uh, nationalistic. Actually, yeah. well, I think you, you saw a bit of that during the American election. I mean, the people who voted for Trump are overwhelmingly not from the city. Mm. Or urban areas, much more rural areas as a rule, and yeah, it's obvious why there there's that connection in, in more rural areas or smaller towns, uh, because well, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, in smaller towns you don't typically have you know das 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 or whatever, <laughs> uh, yeah. so it would make sense that. You know, people. It, it'd be easier for people to identify with that sort of thing. Um, speaking of which, I haven't had German food in a long time. I probably should have some. I'll tell you. you I'll definitely have should. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in my experience, but every now and then, something like a nice Zabra, uh with uh, mit Rotkraut und Klößen. Mother Spätzle guy. Nicht mal. Nicht mal um, ja. was, I was thinking um, uh, Sauerbraten mit 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 Rotkohl und und, und Apfelstücken. Ah, ah, yeah, that sounds. That, that's my thing. That that's sounds thing. great. Yeah, yeah, and maybe something like a Klos or I don't know. It doesn't mm. really matter. Some kind of Kartoffel. Yeah, I'm a sucker for most German food. I mean, I I really love. I like love, German I mean, food. I just find it too yeah, heavy. Yeah. So it's not something I can have on any regular mm. basis. But if I go a couple of months without having, it, I might. Swing by a more tradition. I don't drink beer, but I'll uh, I'll order myself a Sauerbraten or well, I'm not really the schnitzel kind of guy, but definitely some some of the more traditional things. Well, Sauerbraten's my favorite, so that's the one that comes to mind. But, you know. Yeah, I mean, I was I lost so much weight in Japan just because I have I have my budget. You know, I don't spend more on food per month than amount X, and in Japan you you cannot cook German then. Yeah, so I had to. To uh, use the local ingredients and these staple foods that you have there, and ooh, I lost a lot of weight there, <laughs> but it was d- d- delicious. So I just like German food so much. When I have it around, I eat it. Uh, it's, I have to work yeah, out I mean, more it, to balance it, it out, it, but yeah. And for me, it's more like a treat. Every mm, couple of months. It's maybe more healthy. Yeah. 
our food is traditionally made for people who are like lumberjacks who <laughs> are construction yeah. workers yeah. or farmers so they lots of physical labor then you can eat German food that's fine but if you work in an office and sit around all day pff, that should be a Sunday thing more or less then yeah like I said every couple of months yeah. sometime before the new year I'm gonna I'm gonna get myself a, a Zalabraten at some I'm not that fussy. Anyway, I think we've uh, you gotta get going soon. Yep, and, indeed. Um, it's a good. Uh, yeah, that was so a good last everyone, topic, I think. <laughs> uh, yeah, everyone, thanks for tuning in, and uh, I will hopefully upload this soon. And I think Red Pill will upload it on his channel. Yeah. Uh, thanks for having me again. Um, yeah. Always a pleasure. Bye bye. <laughs>